Good evening. Welcome to this week's Hope Looks Up Bible Study with Dr. Tom Haney on May 3rd, 2022. Tonight we start a new Bible study series titled Eyewitness of His Majesty, the Protection of God, uh, New Testament chapter 2 Peter. Tonight's lesson is the first of a series of nine lessons and is titled The Protection of Belonging. Scripture reference is 2 Peter 1, 1 to 9. Thank you for participating in tonight's lesson, both on Zoom and YouTube. Our meeting consists of two parts, teaching and prayer time. Prayer time will follow teaching and is optional, but available to those who have urgent prayer needs. Please refer to the Hope Looks Up website at hopelooksup.org for recently updated Bible study schedules, previous study resources, and other Hope Looks Up ministry events. For those who wish to support this ministry, a donation link is provided it provides a form and instructions on how donations can be made and is found on the hopelooksup.org website. We will begin with a word of prayer followed by Dr. Tom Haney. Lord, we are excited about starting a new nine-week study of the book of 2 Peter, and we look forward to learning about the protection of God. We are blessed to live in a country where we can safely meet to study your word. Bless all those who participate tonight on Zoom and on YouTube, and we are most grateful for our teacher, Dr. Tom Haney. Tom? Well, thank you, Chuck, and welcome, everybody. It's so good to be back with you. Uh, it seems like a lot more than a month that we have missed to me, anyhow, but I've been very, uh, very excited to be in contact with several of you, and I just am glad that you're here tonight as we take a look at God's protection. You know, when we study the Bible, we need to understand the length, the breadth, the height, and the depth of God's protection. I'm afraid a lot of times we just worry about what is affecting us. Maybe it's our health, maybe it's our peace, maybe it's our security, and that's the only place we really look at God's protection. And I want us to see that it's not just a focus on where we have a need. God in his sovereignty and his providence constantly works to make sure that we have total protection over our lives. And he will uphold and guide and care for all of his creation. That's the theme of these two Bible books that are attributed to Peter, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Peter was teaching Gentile Christians. Some of the books written only exclusively to Gentile Christians, and they were undergoing a tremendous time of persecution. We need to realize not only were the pagan religions and pagan governments persecuting them. But for the first few centuries, the Jews many times were persecutors of Christians as well, especially Gentile Christians. It was a very, very hard time for them. I find it insightful. Peter did not talk about their strength and resiliency. He didn't talk about their ability to uh, do counterattacks and guerrilla warfare. He didn't talk about their ability to hide and keep the persecutors from finding them, nor did he focus on anything about them. Over and over, Peter told them about the protection of God, and in a series of ways, he told them about different types of God's protection. Tonight, we're going to look at belonging. Now, maybe we don't really consider that a lot of protection, but I want to just think of some things. Think how often people without family and not belonging to family have a great difficulty finding peace in their life. How many times going to a new situation, being involved with people that seem different from you, and you're saying, wow, I, I, don't, I don't belong here. I, I don't have a place here. How insecure that makes us feel. If you feel that you're facing a crisis or a series of crises tonight in which they're more powerful than you are, then the study of Second Peter is the right study for you. Well, I think the big thing for Peter to get across to us is, by what authority is Peter saying that you have this protection? And Peter says, it's by the very authority of Jesus Christ himself. And that authority was given to him when Jesus was on the earth, and Peter and two other disciples witnessed the tremendous power that was involved in who Jesus was. We call it the Mount of Transfiguration. But let me just read what the Bible word said. Peter's exact words are, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. 
but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. It's one of the themes I'm going to be using these nine weeks. Eyewitnesses of his majesty. There are a lot of books of the Bible. And 2 Peter is one of them that just says over and over and over, it's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. He saved you. He gave you faith. He's the one that takes care of you. He's the one who protects you. He goes ahead and says, he received honor and glory from God the Father. This came to him from majestic glory. Don't you love that other than just out of the sky? When the, the voice come from God, this is my my well pleased. It came from the majestic glory. Uh, in other words, it wasn't just something in the air. It actually came from God himself. And what God said is, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice, Peter says, that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Well, I want to take the advice of this great apostle of Jesus. The first preacher of the church, remember on the day of Pentecost, although all were preaching, Peter was the main spokesperson. This man that cho God chose to launch the church, and this one who was able to stand up to authorities and rulers and those desiring to kill him, and still do so without ever wavering in his faith. I think we have a lot to learn these nine weeks of study about the protection of God. When I was thinking about the protection of God, I immediately remembered a list that Dr. Reagan had put in his book, Christ in Prophecy. Well, she wrote 50 prominent signs that show that we're in the end season of, of the world. He lists them in six categories, and I've taken six of these tonight to just kind of frame what we're talking about as far as our need for protection. The first one is increased instability of nature. Matthew 24 and Luke 21 tells us that's going to happen, and this has become such a problem in our time that the world is hastily devising ways to change nature. Now, I know if climate control says no, mankind has changed nature, and now mankind has to change nature back. But that's exactly what we're talking about. We're trying to change nature. The goal of climate control is to restore a world where nature is in balance with what the world thinks nature should be. In other words, what has it been the last 300 years? That's what it should be. We should have that amount of rain. We should have that amount of variance, and so on. So this is continuing to be an increasing problem. Increasing lawlessness and violence, Matthew 24, 32. It's become such a problem that even in the United States, we have a series of groups, Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter are just two that immediately come to mind that show that people come from very different sources on how they feel that lawlessness and violence needs to be handled. The crime rate in the U.S. continues to climb. The solution for many is just finger pointing, it's you, or it's this, or it's that. Increasing immorality. One of the big arguments for legalizing many things, gambling, abortion, use of marijuana, has been that it would make it legal, and that would eliminate people breaking the laws and make our nation more moral. <laughs> How's that for a pile of craziness? Um, after the fact of watching these ideas lived out, does anyone believe that we're more moral now that gambling is legal in every place, that use of marijuana has made us more moral, that uh, the uh, use of abortion. So it'll be interesting to see that fight uh, continue out. You know, people talk about as though it was a constitutional right to have abortion without realizing that it was 51 years ago in what seemed to most of us as one of the strangest decisions we've ever heard the Supreme Court make that abortion would be legal on all basis. Then the increasing in materialism. Government programs to help businesses of all kinds with money handout through COVID, many authorities believe will lead to the biggest fraud that we have ever seen in the United States. They say we really haven't even touched the hem of the garment of how many billions were wasted in fraud through COVID handouts. Increased hedonism, 2 Timothy 3.4. Our nation leads the world in pornography, producing it, in producing lewd forms of visual entertainment. And we certainly have a world now that has a focus on many things sexual. And the last one I want to just throw in tonight as we look at again the protection of God is the increasing influence of humanism, 2 Timothy 3.2. You know, the first five signs I mentioned, uh, 
problems in nature, problems in lawlessness, problems in morality, uh, the increase in hedonism, the increase in materialism. The solution for every one of those, our leaders say, is more humanism. It's man figuring out these problems and finding out what they are and coming up with solutions. Uh, so I want us to see that that's only going to continue to make things worse. Humanism has become the go-to in almost all the problems of our nation by our leaders. But humanism caused almost all the problems. So I want to start where Peter did. He addressed a group of people who were, like the Ukrainians, being forced out of their homes. Businesses were being taken. People were being killed. People were being uh, put into prison in a variety of ways. And Peter, as he addresses this group, he claims for them the protection of God. We have the right foundation for that protection. I think that's one of the real keys that I want us to catch tonight. We have the right foundation. In first, Second Peter 1, verses 1 and 2, Peter lays out the right foundation for always having the protection of God. He reminded us that we have received salvation by divine will. And I think sometimes we forget that. We talk about our part in salvation, how difficult it was to, to find salvation, how difficult it was to, to, to make a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we many times forget that the Bible is very clear that our salvation came from God. It was not just a gift that God gave us that we could take a part of. It was a gift God gave us that we would become aware of. Faith is a gift from God. Salvation is a gift of God. And Peter uses a word here that should just clarify that for all of us. He uses the same word as they used in Acts 1, casting of lots to choose Matthias as the disciple to replace Judas. And so he says, God has given you that salvation and that faith. And not only is it not your personal effort, not your skill, not your worthiness, not even your inherent value. We need to realize our righteousness is filthy rags. That isn't what got us saved. It was the righteousness of Jesus and his gift of faith that led us to believe. Peter says something I want us to catch. Peter says, that faith we received from Christ and the salvation that followed, it's identical to the faith and the salvation that he received and the disciples received. These converted later were just as precious. In fact, he uses a phrase in your Bible, might be translated this way in verse 1, like precious faith and salvation. So there is no first class or second class Christians in social or racial or gender distinctions, those close to Jesus because they were disciples, those not as close. There's no rankings of Christians in the spiritual world either. Some may do more with their faith and salvation that they've received, but that does not make their faith and salvation superior. Peter was addressing Gentile Christians, and he may have been very explicit about this because he wanted them to realize Jewish Christians did not have a leg up on them as far as having the protection of, of Jesus. Jesus was going to protect them just as he met, as much as he was protecting those Jewish Christians. The foundation has all been laid by Jesus Christ for every Christian. He's both God and our Savior. The foundation is right for our protection because it's built on the knowledge that Jesus is our Savior and our Lord. Christianity, you see, is not a mystical religion. It's not a matter of feeling. It's not a matter of incantations. You don't learn the right phrases to say. Christianity, the Bible says, and Peter here says, is something that is something you can study. Our salvation and faith is based on objective, historical, revealed, and rational truth from God. Christianity was given by God to be understood and believed. It is the understanding and knowledge of Christianity that represents that deeper, wider, longer, and higher acceptance of the protection of God. And sometimes all of us have to just reach that point of saying, I don't understand this, but I know God's in charge, and I know he's protecting me in the way that is right for me. Each one of us who is a believer, saved by God, given faith and salvation, 
and belief in Jesus Christ have this foundation. So now let's look at what that foundation, that protection does for us. The right promises to live and experience that protection. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Peter gets right to it. He reminds us that the key to God's protection is not something that we're doing. It's something Jesus has already done for us. He has put us in the family of God, and God will protect us. I don't know that we really always experience how great of a protection that is. We belong to God. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We're brothers and sisters with Christ. We're brothers and sisters with the disciples, with David, with Samuel, with you, you name it, every hero of the Bible that's in heaven. We're brothers and sisters with each one of those. He's put us in the family of God, and he will protect us. My heart was broken, and I'm sure yours was too, to see Afghan mothers hold their babies, little bitty babies, over the fence at the Kabul airport, seeking and begging the American soldiers to take their babies so they could have freedom and find a way to escape Afghanistan. We have a mass movement of people all over our world who are breaking up the traditional family unit in an effort to save the children or to allow their children to prosper and come back and rescue them. We've seen it often in Ukraine, where the elderly, sometimes those who have not even gotten out of the house, are now at 90 years old, taking little babies and loading them up on the train with them to get them to a NATO country where they can be free and they can find freedom for their life. We've watched for years the increasing number of teenagers and younger children, some as young as four and five and six, come from Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras to our southern border without any family or any adults accompanying them to try to find asylum in the United States. In our present world, the family has frequently been broken in a human effort to save the next generation. I want to say something to you. This will never happen to us spiritually. God does not break up his family. Now you have to realize his family doesn't mirror ours. God doesn't have grandchildren. Christian, Christian, you know, we have to all believe. But well, once you're in the family of God, he never breaks it up. One of the great characteristics of God's protection is that God says all believers belong to him in his family. You do not get different rules for different stages of your life. The promises of God are so truthful for you that when you die physically, they will be with you just as clearly as they were when you died spiritually to self and was saved and reborn in the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the main protections that our God gives to us is that he has assured us that we will never give up on someone who is willing to let the Holy Spirit speak to their heart. God never quits on anyone unless they spiritually rebuke or deny him. The Bible is clear, and Jesus confirmed this truth, because the first promise of God that he would send a redeemer, or in the Jewish word, a Messiah, to rescue willing humans from the sin of Adam and Eve, was given right after Adam and Eve had committed the sin in the Garden of Eden. God's words were addressed to Satan. Satan had tempted Adam and Eve, and they'd given in. And he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise you on the head and you will bruise him on the heel. This is the Bible's first messianic prophecy. It's also one of the very first prophecies at all. These words were spoken by God to Satan after he tempted Adam and Eve to sin against God, and they did. It's a remarkable statement of God's unbelievable and unfathomable grace. In the disappointment of watching his creation sin, he is promising them and every offspring of theirs that comes after, that includes you and I, he will send a redeemer who will defeat Satan entirely. Despite their rebellion, God reveals that he'll provide a way of reconciliation for Adam and Eve and their offspring. It will come through the seed of woman. One of the clear prophecies of the virgin birth of Jesus. Jesus, the only person ever born on this earth from the seed of woman. Every other person created on this, born on this earth, was born through the seed of man. And so it says he would be born of a virgin. He states that Satan will bruise the Messiah on the heel. 
a non-lethal wound represented by the cross. Now you might say, wait a minute, Pastor Tom, Jesus died. Non-lethal in the sense it didn't last long. Jesus died on Friday, on Sunday he was alive. And certainly it was not something that actually quickly, was not quickly dispersed of. In fact, it's the very basis on which our promised protection that death no longer has any hold on us was, was realized. God further states that the Messiah or Jesus, the Redeemer, will bruise Satan. He'll bruise him on the head. The lethal wound of the Messiah's second coming, where Satan will be bound and ultimately after he's let out of that binding, will be cast into the lake of fire at the end of the Messiah's millennial reign. It's one of the most wonderful promises that guarantees us the protection of God upon all of his believers and all allows people to see that God always intended to protect his children. When there was only two, he said, I'm sending a redeemer. Now there's billions. He still has a redeemer. And until Christ comes again, that redeemer is hard at work. Christians are promised every one of these promises because they have become new creations. You see, when we were changed and born again, made a new creation, we received every one of those promises that are there for Christian people. And into this life and into the time that went coming, we'll realize and real and re receive our glorified bodies. We'll have the mind and the desire of Christ in our lives. This will be the first insulation for any invasion of corruption, falling back under the influence and direction of sin. If we live under and accept all the precious promises of God, it will keep it from happening. So we have the foundation of his protection. He gave us his faith. He gave us his salvation. We have the way to put it into practice, the precious promises of God. And if we live those out and stay in those, we will have that level of protection. And last of all, I want us to realize tonight, since we belong to God, we have the right place for all these protections to be realized. In the last four verses, five verses we're studying tonight, 2 Peter 1, 5 through 9, Peter declares that must be the motivation for our Christian life. Good works and our righteousness do not save us. Good works and our righteousness will not keep us in Christ. We do not do good because we're Christians. We do good because God has given us precious promises of protection, and they guide us into goodness. So we don't do goodness because we suddenly learned how to do it. We just trust in the precious promises of God. And you know what? They make us good. We begin to deliver goodness in our lives. We've not reached our goal when we're converted. We've reached the starting point where God can move us into a totally different relationship. He's given us all that we need, and we need to give him also our maximum effort. So Peter says we're to add to our faith. Well, the word add here is an interesting word. It means give lavishly or generously. And in the original Greek, it was talking about a choir master. Now, we are so uh, wrapped up in how talented you have to be to be in the choir that we don't consider choir mastering much of a you know, it's a role for the specialist in the music area. But in the Greek times, everybody, just like they all went to the gym, everybody was expected to also be a performer of some sort, either in drama or in music or in some other area. And so the choir master in the Greek language was the one who furnished everything for the choir to do a good job. It's sort of like today when you don't have strong voices in the choir, so you leave some of the background on the tape playing so that it sounds like it's just kind of filling in all those voices. Well, the choir master adds. He adds so much that it makes it all sound good. And it was not individual accomplishment, but it represented the fact that one should prepare as well as possible so they could give a good life to God and to those around them. So Peter begins with that list of characteristics that would allow us to produce the life that maximizes the protection of God. And I want you to know, these are the things that God is adding to our life, believe it or not. And if you don't feel like you have too many of them, you know what? You probably haven't let him add enough. It starts with this, be virtuous. 
Now here, virtuous, we a lot of times kind of today make virtuous sound like living a moral life and a pure life. But here, virtuous is more heroic in the actually idea of helping others, being excellent in all that we do, accomplishing the most that we possibly can, uh, making the maximum impact on our world. And then knowledge that we are versed and trained. Now, you can chalk up a point for watching Hope Looks Up tonight and every night you look because you're adding knowledge to, to, uh, to that and God's provided it and you're taking advantage of it. Bless your hearts. And then he says we're to be trained. Uh, Self-control. Think of an athlete, how self-discipline, uh, the use of their body, what they put into their body, the exercise that they make and so on. And finally, he says perseverance. Only doing what is right and being godly in that, reverent, loyal, and obedient to God. Peter then turns and reminds everybody that needs to be done with love. The love of our brothers and love towards everyone. You see, when we are in a right relationship with God, we're in a place to receive all of his protection. Every precious promise of God is one more special gift for us, and it propels us to even better and move even closer and nearer to him. When Sharon and I were in Melbourne, Australia, I went on a tour of a nature preserve right outside of Melbourne. I went to see some of the different species of animals that we hadn't got a chance to see when we were just in the countryside around Sydney and Darwin. And of course, I wanted to see those fabulous koala bears. Uh, we got to see, I got to see several of them and snap some uh, beautiful pictures. And yes, if you ever wanna look at my koala bear pictures, just uh, send me a note and uh, I, I can email you a picture or two. But the entertainers of the preserve were not the koala bears. Actually, they're kind of scary little cats. They climb up in the tree and when they see you, they climb higher. And if they're young enough and agile enough, they get up in the highest of branches, put your camera on Zoom, and only then do you get to see them. Uh, they just disappear. The entertainers of the preserve were the kangaroos. Kangaroos are playful, cheerful, and uh, pretty much fun. They had pushed, they had planted bushes down, long bushes down rows about every hundred yards for about seven or eight acres. And so as the tour people would make their way, the kangaroos would run to the next set of bushes. Then we would hurry over to the next set of bushes to see them there and they just went back to the others. So this game was going on and on and on. And I decided on one of these, I wouldn't follow the kangaroos. I would just go back the opposite way from where they came and I got my best photos of the day. And one of them was by far the cutest picture I got outside of the koala bears. And here was a mama kangaroo about 30 feet in front of me. And her little Joey was hanging up out of the pouch with his hands on top of the pouch and his shoulders and his head looking out at me. I guess he wanted to see how this game was going. The kangaroos or the tourists were winning. I'm not sure uh, why he was that visible, but he was quite visible. But as soon as they saw me, choom, he dove right back in that pouch. Mom did a 180. Hop, 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 and off she went through the next set of bushes. I see that as a great figure of the protection of God. When our curiosity gets the best of us, we may move to the edge of our protection with God. But when we sense danger or alarm, you know what? We can always burrow back into the place we are the closest to God, living in light of his full protection literally that you belong to him will allow that you that to be your approach for every crisis in your life a desire to get closer to god for all your earthly life and then let your life blend into his protection and direction for eternity peter closes this passage by reminding all who read it that there's a special place of god's protection is a special gift of god and it should spur us to draw closer to him. The one who does not value the special place of protection from God, simply because you belong to him, Peter says has amnesia and useless mind. <laughs> I kind of picked up on that and I said, yeah, I think it makes means that you're spiritually retarded. But Peter merely says, no, you're nearsighted and blind. In other words, you can't even see where your help is or what's helping you. When I was a boy growing up on the farm, we milked a lot of cows. 
Uh, we milk them by hand. That's not a job I would encourage any of you to learn. Uh, it has no future unless you want to go to a third world country and live in poverty. But we never trained our cows to come to the barn for the, by their cells on the evening. Now, morning milking was easy. We just kept them in the barn overnight. Fed them, they slept in the barn. And, you know, you just went down and milked them in the morning. And we never kept them in the lot by the barn. We allowed our cows to go down to the pasture, which was about a quarter of a mile down to the creek, then a, another quarter of a mile past, down the end of the creek, where there was a very hilly field that was uh, full of alfalfa they loved, and that's where they went. So that was getting the cows for the milking every night was a job for the boys. One summer afternoon, mom asked my brother Howard and I to go get the cows uh, for time to, to get milking. As I said, it was about a half a mile back to the pasture. We were dressed in our normal summer outfits, cut off blue jeans. No shirt, no shoes, no jackets, just cut off blue jeans. That's how we ran around all summer. But we did not rush to get the cows. So by the time we got to the field, there was a large ominous cloud, black and ugly looking on the west horizon. That's where all of our big storms came from in the Midwest. And it was pressing down on us. We tried in vain to get the cows to start to the barn. But cows are much smarter than humans, and they don't move during a storm. They just simply turn their backs, their rear ends to the storm, hide their heads down in the grass, bundle up in a group, and don't move. So we couldn't get them to move either. Soon the sheets of rain started to pound on our backs, so we headed for the woods. That's what we call the 50 or 60 scrub trees that grew along the creek. We stopped in front of the first one, the big large one that we all kind of liked, our family favorite. And uh, we decided we better get, needed to get back because it was kind of sitting by itself and the rain was still smacking the daylights out of us. And right after we left it, a bolt of lightning hit the top of it, splintered the tree to the ground. Uh, that puts the fear of seven and eight year old boys real quickly. And even though the rain was not letting up, we might have been pretty large physically, but we were pretty young still. And this weather was not something that we were able to handle. Then we heard a voice in the middle of the rain calling out, Tom, Howard, Tom, Howard, and kept up and looked at each other and looked out there in the heavy rain. And there was our with their old farm jacket on and their hat, hat, hat tie, tied down on her head. And uh, we went running out immediately got the farm jackets that she had gotten, wrapped them up around us, had a couple of hugs, and then hit it off in the rain towards the house. Actually, and of course, you know, as an eight-year-old, you remember things differently, but it seems like when we crossed the creek, it was about chest high at that point. Who, who knows? We just had a lot of rain in a real hurry. We got to the house, we dried off, we changed clothes, we got dressed in heavier clothes to go back and get the cows because uh, they weren't going to move in the storm anyhow. And, uh, and, and we did, did so, we actually found out when we went over and jumped over the, the gate fence that the cows had made their way back up. So we only had to go a few feet to get them. Years later, after my older sister, brother and I had all moved out of the house and established our own homes and families, we were talking about raising children one day. And in the midst of all of that, my mother stopped and said, well, I am so grateful that I didn't give you any of my phobias about storms. Well, that kind of caught my ear. And mother continued and she said, when I was a little girl, I was the oldest and I was supposed to be the brave one, but she said, storms scare me tremendously. And our old farmhouse, you could actually go into an inner room because of how the stairway went upstairs and how the dining room had a separate area off of it, close all the doors and be completely enclosed in a room without any windows. And she said, that's what I would do. I would go in there, close those doors, sit in this big chair, wrap my arms around myself and shake until the storm was done. Well, that triggered a thought in my mind. I said, Mom, I remember when you came down in the middle of a horrible storm and you got Howard and I out of the woods and probably, probably at least saved us from getting a terrible, terrible problems. I said, how did you overcome your phobia and your fear enough to do that? And I remember she looked right at me. I told this, uh, at her memorial service because it was so touching to me as a young man. And she said, those were my boys. Those were my boys, she said. I just had to come and get you. Now, if our earthly parents 
with their human frailties could protect us much. Can you imagine what our all-powerful God can do to protect and preserve us? We belong to God, and God is quite aware of that. He counts you as his. Peter says to remember that God lines our lives with precious promises of the protection that we have simply because we have a place to receive those. We are in the family of God. We need to let the Lord build on that foundation of our life and live in that protection. Can you see now how cool that song of the Gaithers was, that one from several years ago, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the water. I've been cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus to travel this side. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Dr. Randy Guzola, president of the Institute of Creation Research, wrote this. He said, the revelation of the personal ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ is a central message of the Bible. Like bookends of biblical revelation, we find the Lord Jesus created all things at the beginning and reigns over all things at the end. Creation and consummation are two works of the Lord that are by necessity linked. And as Paul explains who Christ is in Colossians 1, he links the fact that Christ is first the creator of all things and continues as the sustainer or protector of all things, and therefore has full authority in every sense to be the legitimate redeemer of all things. He has full power over everything that includes the protection of his own. I want to close tonight by reading that passage out of Colossians, because I think it speaks so much of the protection that comes simply because of who we are. We belong to God. We are under Christ. Christ has created us. He sustains us. He redeems us. He brings us home. It says this. This is verses 15 through 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. You see, he's the creator and the sustainer. He's the protector. He's the glue that holds and binds. He is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all the fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So I want to leave you with one thought tonight. He protects us because that's what he came to do. He came to protect and sustain his creation so that we could experience his redemption forever. I hope tonight, as you experience some points where you need God's protection, you will remember I belong to God. God will protect me. Maybe not in the way I sense or want or feel, but he will protect me in what is ultimately right for me. Join us next week as we study how God protects us through his constant confirmation. I think it will be a great encouragement to you that God confirms his people. Well, let me turn it back over to you tonight, Chuck. Thank you for joining us on Hope Looks Up. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, another good lesson. I, uh, it's good to think about uh, that God is there to protect us because there's sure a lot going on in our world that is pretty scary. So uh, we need to keep, keep reminding ourselves so that we don't get too, uh, too upset over everything. And if we keep our focus on him, if we hope looks up, we, we can survive all of this. So, well, thank you again, Tom. I will be Posting tonight's lesson on the Hope Looks Up YouTube site on Thursday, and the notes will be uh, distributed on Sunday. Next week, the eyewitness of His Majesty, uh, the protection of God, will continue as we study 2 Peter 1, 